Welcome, Patreon subscribers, to another episode of Underworld Shorts. These are the mini episodes that we're doing now for the Patreon. Please let us know, like, if you guys like these, if you want us to do more interviews instead, you know, just all of that. We, uh, we definitely want to be responsive to what you guys are interested in. But today's episode is about a guy they call the Gassar of New York City, or the Indian godfather, Gormit Singh Dinsa. It's a beautiful rags-to-riches you know, the quintessential American dream, except with a heavy dose of contract killing and uh, all sorts of other shady fraud and things like that. It's basically the story of Scarface, but with an Indian guy and gas instead of a Cuban guy and cocaine. Singh is born in India in the early 1960s in a rural part of Punjab. He moves to Cologne, Germany when he's about 20 or so. You know, he's looking to make his fortune but he ends up just working a bunch of dead-end jobs, not really succeeding. So four years later, he marries an American somehow. I, I couldn't get a lot of details on this. Gets a green card and ends up in the Bronx where, you know, American dreams are made. Kind of picture Eddie Murphy in Coming to America in, uh, in Flushing, Queens. And I kind of feel like that's what, uh, what his experience might have been like. But this is 1982, and as fans of this podcast know... The Bronx is like no joke back then during the early 80s. Well, actually, the Bronx is never really a joke. Like even now, uh, it's still, still dicey, still a rough place to, uh, to, to cast your lot. But he gets a job as a gas station attendant. He's basically like pumping gas and just kind of like, you know, using the squeegee on windshield wipers that, that comes out. And he starts saving money. But the station isn't doing so well. So he's able to, he's able to strike a deal with an investor after a few years to lease it out. Part of the problem is what the Daily News calls hostile neighbors who are using the gas station as a parking lot. But Singh, like, he's this really tough dude. He's not about to put up with that. So the very first night he has control, he takes a baseball bat and he just smashes up all the windows and windshields of the cars that are parked there. And what do you know? Problem solved. The neighbors never park there again. The partner kind of backs away. Again, not a lot of details on that part. And the gas station turns profitable. And Singh, he starts buying up more and more gas stations, a lot of them in, in bad neighborhoods like this one. In no time, he's a multimillionaire. But he's got a bit of what you would call a bad attitude, right? He gets arrested for assault in 1985. In 1990, he gets arrested again for kidnapping, robbery, and assault, but pleads out to a weapons charge and only serves 90 days. And this whole time, he's just kind of straight up like bullying, assaulting, intimidating anyone in the way of his gas station empire. In 1991, there's a confrontation at one of his gas stations in Corona, Queens. And his brother, who's kind of like his right-hand man, his lieutenant, he shoots and kills a guy and then flees back to India. This whole time, too, he's running gas scams. I mean, listeners, you know, long-time listeners of the podcast might recall, we've talked about some of the more prolific gas, gas scams that the Italian mafia and Russian organized crime figures were doing in the 80s. Big-time mafioso turned YouTuber. Michael Franzisi, is there a sadder sentence in the English language than big time mafioso turned YouTuber? Although, you know, Franzisi's, you know, he's doing what he can, but either way, like what a, what a phrase. So he's a capo in the Colombo family at this time, and he's infamous for coming up with one version of this gas scams, which involve transferring gas between shell companies and finding a way to avoid paying specific taxes on the fuel. And this gas scam actually nets like Tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, I think. It was like one of the greatest mafia scams of all time. Singh has a different idea. It's kind of a shittier one that just scams his customers instead of the government. So, you know, we can't support that. Basically, he sold crappy gas that he marked as premium. And he had some sort of skimming device put on his pumps where he would give you less gas than you paid for. Like if you paid for $10, it would end up giving you $9.50 or $9.85 or something like that. Which is something like, I actually get suspicious of this at pumps all the time. But uh, in 1992, he actually gets caught and charged with fraud for the first time. In 93, he gets arrested on another weapons charge and serves a year in prison or jail. But this whole time, his empire is building up, right? He's got millions. Something like 50 gas stations in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I think like upwards of 300 employees. He's doing $60 million a year in revenue driving a Beamer. He gets a big house in Mill Basin, which is a neighborhood uh, on the water in kind of deep Brooklyn, where actually lots of Russian and Italian mafiosos live. They have these big gaudy mansions and things like that. And he's on, he's on the water, so he parks a 30-foot boat outside. 
This whole time, though, he's becoming sort of infamous for terrorizing the local Sikh community and just running things like a crime boss. When he later gets arrested for murder, the Daily News interviews an Indian cab driver who says, quote, Nobody had a positive feeling about him, said the cabbie, adding that Dinza was famous among his Punjabi brethren for keeping himself surrounded by American bodyguards who frisked those who dared to get near him. And it also adds that no one in the community was surprised when he finally got arrested. So a bunch of his employees, he kind of uses them like an enforcement arm. In 1995, he has some of them kidnap an employee he thinks is stealing, a recent Indian immigrant. That's another thing too, he really preyed on recent Indian immigrants. This guy never heard from again. And I think about a year and a half later, the disappeared guy's brother flies in from India, like a rural guy, you know, because he hasn't heard from his brother in a while. And he starts kind of poking around, asking his friends, asking gas station employees, just kind of trying to suss out what happens. And he's getting close to figuring it out. He's about to go to the police. But right before he does that, he's sitting in his car and somebody just walks up to him and shoots him twice in the head at three o'clock in the morning. That happens in 1997. Singh is 35 years old then, and the feds, they're closing in on him for all that gas scam stuff. And people are talking, right? They're starting to talk about, you know, all these people who have disappeared, all these people that class was Singh, all this violence, all that stuff that was around. And around this time, he makes another dumb mistake. And I, feel, I kind of feel like this happens a lot, right? People like this, they just start getting cocky. They think they can get away with anything because they have so far. Maybe they're unaware the feds are building a case on them. It's, it's always just a pattern. But he basically decides, He's going to have his brother fly back in, the one who was wanted for murder, come back from India and, and help him run the empire. But the feds are tipped off because people are talking and they stake out his headquarters, which is in a warehouse waiting for the brother to arrive. When he finally gets there and goes to the office, they raid it and they arrest three people and also confiscate like a whole bunch of guns. Singh actually isn't there at the time, but he shows up to argue with the police and tell them it's his property, which again, you know, maybe... Maybe let that one go, you know, maybe, uh, maybe sit back in that sort of situation. I feel like the real gangster types and like the real mafiosos are like, no, it's actually not mine. It's this low level employees. Like that's the smart move in that situation. So he gets like locked up then, but I think they can't charge him. This was unclear too. They can't charge him with anything or he's only charged with low level crime. So he's able to post bail and get out. So one of the employees that's talking to police, he's actually going to testify in the brother's murder trial. And Singh knows it, right? He's been hard at work intimidating any and all witnesses to his crimes, talking to everyone who worked for him and trying to figure out what's going on in the local community. So much so that the local Sikh community starts calling him the Indian Godfather. And he's entirely focused on making sure his brother's case falls apart. Right before the trial is about to begin, the witness is driving in Brooklyn and he gets into a fender bender with a white van. A small argument starts and a guy emerges from the white van, calmly walks out, shoots him eight times, doesn't bother with his passenger, walks in the van, and drives off. And there's witnesses to this. You know, this is, this is a thing that, that people see. And the shooters are eventually caught. One of them is a security guard at the gas station company. Another is an employee. And they, of course, turn state's evidence and say they were paid $20,000 for the hit. The killing of the witness, though, that sets off a frenzy. There's witness, I mean, not the witness, the informant, I'm sorry. There's witnesses and more people in the community are talking. And shortly after, the feds wrap up Singh. He's suspected in at least eight murders. His initial charges, according to Daily News, include, quote, charges that Dinsa ordered the June 18th killing of Saturnjit Singh, a former employee whom Dinsa suspected of helping investigators with the prosecution of Dinsa's brother, Gurdip Singh. Gurdip Singh was arrested last May 16th for a 1991 Queens murder. Satendrit Singh, no relation, was expected to testify as a witness. So Dinsa allegedly had him killed. Dinsa also had been charged with the 1995 murder of another employee he reportedly suspected of stealing, as well as the 1997 murder of the employee's brother, who traveled from India to investigate his brother's death. You know, he's also hit with fraud stuff for the gas stay, scams, racketeering, all sorts of stuff like that, weapons charges. And they say he's suspected of having ties to Russian mobsters involved in the fuel shipping industry. He's actually facing the death penalty at his trial, but he hires a famous top-notch defense attorney. The guy can't save him, but he gets him off the death sentence. Trial goes eight weeks in 1999, and he's convicted and sentenced to life without parole. Interestingly, I found an article like eight years later in the Times. It's kind of on the emergence of, of cell phone tracking data, like pings on antennas or whatever it was they talk about in that first season of Serial. And the lawyer in the article 
is quoted, this defense attorney is quoted as saying how this trial was the first time here the judge had ever seen cell phone data location points used and the prosecutors had used it to play sing at the scene of one of the murders. So uh, there you go. There's the tale of the uh, gas station SAR. And um, yeah, unless you guys tell us other words, I think we're going to keep doing little mini episodes like this. Basically, you know, they're interesting stories that we come across that we don't think could, uh, could, could you know, make it for, for full episodes, you know, 10, 12, 13 minute things. But um, let us know what you think about this, about the interviews, about anything else. Uh, the underworld podcast at gmail.com. We always want to hear from you guys, especially, you know, our supporters, because we want you to keep supporting us. I mean, that's, that's the main thing, right? So let us know what you think. And uh, we know we haven't posted up new episodes every week lately. You know, we're kind of in a, in a contract dispute right now with our people. And we're hoping to have some really good news in the next few weeks, but I'm actually headed to Ukraine uh, on Monday. So I'll be there for a bit. Actually might have a gangster story tie in that would be really cool that uh that I'll put up. But until then, thank you guys as always for supporting us and uh be well. <laughs>